my gosh, you were like making me so nervous. <laughs> oh my gosh, why am I like crying right now? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back for a brand new episode of Collider Ladies Night. I am so excited to welcome Kelly Marie Tran to the show to celebrate Raya and also all of your wonderful accomplishments because preparing for this interview, it's just like one incredible thing after the next. It was just such a joy to rewatch so much of your work. Oh my gosh, thanks for saying that. <laughs> so before we jump into any titles here though, I must introduce you to our lovely Ladies Night Dice Tower. I come up with eight questions, roll the die three times, and whatever I roll, that's what we ask to start. Going with number one here. Seven is, ooh, this is a fun one, movie musicals. Because <laughs> your, your missed cast performance was incredible. I can't get enough of it. Oh my Next gosh. Thing, if you ever got the chance to do another one, what song would you pick and why? First of all, thank you so much for watching that. Um, I'm such a huge musical theater nerd, so to be asked to be part of Miss Cast was such a big deal for me. Um, and I love Book of Mormon, so I'm really, I was just so happy to, to be able to do that. If I could choose anything else, I'm dying to be Gavroche and Les Mis. Do they, do they bring people back for more? I feel like we need to make this happen now. I have no idea. <laughs> We're manifesting it in the process. Yeah, we'll manifest it. <laughs> Roll number two for you is number three. Ah, never again. What is something you did for a role that makes you say, I'm so glad I did that, but never ever again? Man, I really don't have that many regrets. Well, I, I, I tend to overcommit, as you can tell by my, my miscast video, um, but I, I don't really have any regrets yet. Uh, knock on wood, that's it's very cool to be able to say. That is, I like that answer. All right, we got one more here. Number six is last step. What is the very last thing that you absolutely have to do before you hit the set to shoot a big scene? I like to take a quiet moment myself um, and remind myself that I'm doing something that I once thought was impossible and that I need to celebrate the fact that I am uh, living a miraculous, magical existence. Um, but yeah, that is what I always do right before I step on a set. I've got three questions for you and we're gonna build a movie out of them. So first, can you pick a movie musical you would love to star in? What is that musical adaptation? And then we'll take it from there. Oh my gosh, I'm nervous. <laughs> um, I care too much. What would you like to star in? Let's start there. <laughs> like, honestly, I'm a shit singer, so I wouldn't want to ruin any of my favorite musicals, but the the first thing that came to mind when I was listening to your missed cast, and also because I think you need to work with John Chu is, is Wicked. <laughs> I would love, love nothing more. <laughs> We're going to put you in the Wicked movie right now. Which role, <laughs> which role do you want to play in Wicked? Oh my gosh, you were like making me so nervous. <laughs> oh my gosh, why am I like crying right now? <laughs> I love musical theater so much. I'm so nervous. <laughs> um, <laughs> if I could play anyone, honestly, I would love to be both. <laughs> how about we do a, a book of like how I did Book of Mormon, but I would do both here. <laughs> this next one might take some of the pressure off. Okay, you can bring three co-cast that you've worked with before to this Wicked exactly. adaptation, who do you bring? Who do I bring? Okay. Oscar Isaac as Fierro. Okay, Naomi Aki and I would play opposite each other. Not sure which character, maybe we'd switch off doing both. <laughs> Glinda and Elba, maybe. Um, and then someone else, dare I say it? <laughs> who would be the wizard? Who would be the wizard? I think Nicolas Cage might have to be the wizard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this could have come out any better. <laughs> We're rolling into the beginning here. I'm going to start with your uh, your sketch comedy. Is there anything about kind of getting your start in the sketch comedy and improv scene that now looking back makes you say, I'm so glad that that was the beginning. That's what my foundation was. Yes. You know, I was doing indie improv shows in like tiny theaters in L.A., with other improvisers and they all became my best friends. And there's this, you know, this very 
uh, the first rule you learn about improv is just yes anding and making sure that you're not turning down someone else's ideas and that you are always adding to something and creating something together. That to me is something I want to take with me always and forever um, because it's such a good way to look at the creative process. Taking a step into Star Wars land right now, I want to know about the audition process because I know with big franchises like that, there's tons of secrecy. So when you do your very, very first audition for Rose, do you have any idea what you're auditioning for, who she is, or are they essentially giving you these random sides where you can't connect the dots between that material and the project you're actually going for? (laughs) I remember getting an email, just like you normally would for an audition, um, but the email said the project was the untitled Ryan Johnson project, which after a little bit of light Googling, it was pretty clear that he was doing episode eight. Um, That being said, the we didn't get sides for pair. It was all like we, they wouldn't even let you have them. So we would get to the audition and then you would be given these sides that were printed on red paper so that you wouldn't take them with you. (laughs) And it was essentially a cold read was the first audition. Um, And I remember like the character description said like twenties, female, charactery, and that was it. Like you didn't really know anything about it. so yeah, it was, it, was, it was wild. I will say the best thing that I did was probably just try as much as possible to be present in the moment and, and pay attention to what the scene was about as opposed to trying to act a genre or, or play to a specific uh, universe, if that makes sense. All right, I did want to ask about the Canto Bite sequence because I have become a very big believer that that sequence does not get the credit it deserves. And what it does for, I don't know, showing a dreamlike place and then showing the corruption and greed that really exists within it is just, it's so touching and meaningful. So let's go, let's go with a two-parter here. I'm not going to overwhelm you. I'll give you one at a time. First, do you think that scene was, I don't know, maybe misunderstood and deserves more credit than it actually got? I love that scene. I mean, I'm biased, so I guess I can say that, but it's weird when you're in a movie and then you sort of, you know, once the movie goes out into the world, your experience with, you know, when I watch that movie, it's like, I remember how I felt that day. I remember John and I walking on set and being like, this is the biggest set we'll ever be on and seeing all of the creatures moving and being part of this universe. Like these are the things I remember about being on set that day. Um, I think, like you said, that does a lot for, um, yeah, really recognizing how certain communities who are able to enjoy their privilege live in a world where they don't even have to address some of the horrible things other people are, are dealing with. Um, I, I love that scene. So Now I want to focus specifically on, I guess it's kind of like a monologue that you deliver to Finn in the movie where you know, it's, a, it's essentially a whole lot of exposition where you're explaining Rose's past to him and it is so incredibly heartfelt. So what would you say is the key to delivering information like that? You know, clearly delivering your lines as you need to, but making sure that the audience is engaging with it and feeling what Rose experienced, which I think you very much accomplish. No, oh, thanks for saying that. Um, I really try not to think about the audience at all. I try to think about where that character is and what they're actually feeling. And and so much of Rose in that moment, so much of the things that she said, I remember getting those sides and and reading that, you know, reading those sides and and working on it. And I was like, I feel like this character is inside of me because so much of my upbringing was that, you know, my parents are also from a war-torn country. My, they had to leave their home in order to escape it. I, we lived in a world where we lived in a a pretty well-off community, but it was because my parents saved every penny and we never went on vacation and they never bought clothes so that we could go move to an area that had good public schools. So to be able to exist in a community where I think people weren't really aware of the struggles that it took other people to even exist. um, Yeah, I relate to that. And I think that um, for that moment, and for me, just as an actor in general, I never want to 
think about how I'm affecting the audience. I always want to think about what is this person really feeling in this moment and be really specific and, and really uh, understand, I guess, that part of human existence. And I think that if you can do that, if you can as much as possible, just be honest and be okay with being seen, even if it's scary, then I think uh, people understand that and are able to um, relate to that. Now, stepping into animation in general, I've just heard so many stories about folks uh, who are live action actors trying to break into voice acting. What, what was the key for you? What kind of started to get the ball rolling in that sector of the industry? I honestly think my improv background was the best thing because Crudes 2 was the first animated project that I got brought on to and I auditioned for it. Um, and I just remember improvising during the entire audition and it was just such a fun experience. Um, and then I auditioned for Raya and yeah, I think the freedom to play and, and to be honest in the moment, but also feel free to like being free to change the words. And I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I think that I've been really, really lucky to work with so many incredible people and also really this is going to sound crazy because when you're a struggling actor in LA, the last thing you want to hear from someone who's in my position, a very privileged position, um, who's, you know, had this miraculous trajectory. Uh, the last thing you want to hear is that, you know, your struggling years really teach you what you need to know. But I, I think that's absolutely true for me. It took me, I don't know. I think I started trying to get an agent in high school and no one wanted me. That was probably 2006 is when I started. And I was on set for Jedi in 2016. So it took me about 10 years. And all of those years of struggling of like going through acting classes and going to casting director workshops and doing the improv, like all of those skills are things that I use now. So I think for me, getting into animation is sort of a culmination of a decade of work. <laughs> With the changes that happen in mind, what would you say is the biggest difference between the first script you read for Raya and what we see in the final product? But something that's specific to you, something that you know is 100% you that would have been entirely different if anyone else had voiced that character. Yeah, I mean, I would say there is a specific scene with Raya that we basically improvised in the booth. And that is the prayer scene when she's in the cave and she sort of says a little inc incantation. And, and I remember reading that scene and I remember really, I know the crazy thing is, is, you know, I'm telling you about this experience, like it was easy for me, but I remember in that moment being very afraid to ask if I could try something different. Um, and I remember feeling like I knew what it was like to be a character or to be a person in life you know, at this point, Raya has traveled for six years and she is at the end of her rope and she doesn't know if any of this is going to lead to anything or if she's just wasted those years searching for this thing. And I remember asking if I could try something different because I remember what it felt like to be desperate. And I remember how I acted in those moments and what it felt like to pray to a being, in this case, Raya's praying to Sisu, that you're not even sure exists, like you're just that desperate. Um, so yeah, that prayer scene was, was absolutely improvised and it made it into the movie, which I just love. We have come to the end of Ladies' Night. We always end with the same two questions. The first one is, name someone who you think is changing this industry for the better. Carlos Lopez Estrada, who I just love so much. He directed me in Raya. He is directing this, or directed this movie Summertime that I'm executive producing that comes out this summer. And I think he's absolutely changing the world. Uh, this movie is about 25 different spoken word artists in Los Angeles, and they're all making their future film de debut. And, and we've talked so much about wanting to sort of pass the megaphone to historically marginalized communities and he's doing that and I just love and adore him so much and he's absolutely changing the world. Did you see me like want to explode when you brought up Summertime because I adore that movie. You I saw, love Summertime? I saw it at Sundance and I fell so hard for this cast. They are incredible. That means so much to me. Last one for you and this can be a heavy one or you could take it in a lighter direction if you prefer. What is the biggest fear that you've ever had that you've actually managed to overcome? 
The biggest fear I've ever had that I've managed to overcome is truly just still existing in this world, I think, and working in this space. I think there was a time where I was afraid to be seen and um, I'm really proud of all the work that I've done to still be here. You should be, you should be, you're awesome. I didn't even bring this up earlier, but we had met the first time during the last Jedi premiere party and you were just so incredibly like infectiously happy and warm and it was seriously like one of the best premiere encounters I've ever had and it's so memorable. And I just love the vibes you put out in this industry. Please keep doing it. You are awesome for everyone out there. Keep an eye out for Raya and the Last Dragon. You can own it on Blu-ray right now. It's available. Go buy it and share it with your family, friends, everybody, because it's wonderful. Kelly, again, thank you for hanging out with us on Ladies Night and huge congratulations. Thank you.